pray to God in the good times so that he's no stranger to you in the bad times. Welcome to Dusty Sandals, where each week we talk with one person for one hour about their story and their walk with Jesus. This week we have with us Mark Verdell. Welcome, Mark. Thank you, Trent. Pleasure to be here. Pleasure to have you here. We're, um, we're here, we're, we're kind of experimenting, I guess. This is our first ever um, podcast and YouTube uh, video for this channel. And uh, so thanks for being the guinea pig, Matt. Yeah, I was just about to say, happy to be the experimental <laughs> type, yeah. And uh, if, if uh, you know, you have post-traumatic stress disorder after this um, session, if we really stuff it up, uh, we can't help you. But I'm sure there's help out there for you. I, 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 I'm sure that there'll be therapy there for me somewhere. <laughs> well, hey, um, let's get right into it. Um, you're a person who we chose because we know that you've got a really interesting journey with God. Um, you're a Christian, I think. Yes, yeah, that's I'm pretty that's, sure. That's true. Um, so let's start with, with where it all began. Where would you kind of say that your, your journey, your walk with Jesus started Yes, probably one of the earliest um, incidents in my life I, that I can remember, I guess, was a time that I borrowed. I didn't steal them. I borrowed some flippers um, from a mate um, without him knowing. Uh, and, <laughs> Sounds uh, like stealing to me. <laughs> yes, but I did intend to return them. And, oh, okay. uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I borrowed them, went to the surf. We had a great surf and uh, one of the flippers came off in the surf. And uh, I remember standing on the on the beach there, praying. Uh, it would not be good to put one flipper back, you know, in Peter's garage. And uh, anyway, um, I, I was there. I was praying, and in the next wave, it just came right up. And well, that could have been a, a, just an amazing coincidence. Mm. But you know, I'd prayed at that point, and as I went home with those two flippers and I, I I put them back in Peter's garage and I did tell him about it. I said, oh, look, I borrowed your flippers the other the other day, you know, and he says, yeah, no problems. And I said, uh, and I returned both of them. Hmm. And he said, yeah, of course you would. And I said, well, nearly I didn't. And I told him the story. Yeah. I'm not sure that he was convinced about the answered prayer, but uh, yeah, mm. that was one of the first things that I, I recall. So how old were you at that point? Yeah, look, I was only probably about um, 10 or 12. And, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, I guess it goes to show that at 10 and 12, you're heading off to the beach on your own. You know, that was a different world back then. You know, you, you, you just sort yeah. of, uh, you, 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 you traveled about and uh, lived up in the Hunter Valley and the opportunity to, to, to just head into some of those great beaches that are, are, oh, yeah. are around there. Yeah, they've got um, a great surf culture up there. Correct, yeah. yes. And yeah. that's the culture that I grew up in. And uh, oh, Yeah, so um, hmm. that, that was, as I said, somewhere between 10 and 12 there. Yeah, cool. Okay, so you you start that that's your first sort of memory with with God that's specific at that early age, mm. and then you 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 grow up a little bit. Were you, was this like a church going family that you were yes, in? Yes, yes, we we were um, we were nominal Christians of of a um, uh, of one particular denomination, but we weren't um, practicing in any sense of, of the word. We were, I guess, you might say, C and E Christians, Christmas and Easter, mm. and uh, yeah. and then um, yes, we 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 then began a journey of looking and exploring, and and uh, you know, my dad and my older siblings were were instrumental in that, and so it was around about the age of of uh, twelve that. Um, uh, that's when I started that journey myself, um, yeah. uh, and began that discovery. And and you know there are some troughs, and then there are some highs. There, um, uh, you get to an age where you've really got to decide for yourself whether God is going to be a part of your own mm -hmm. life. And yep. I happened to be living in America at the time, and I was on my own. I was, I was studying at a, uh, a University of Illinois there, and. Uh, you start to ask yourself those questions: Is God real? And and uh, I, that's when I began to attack, I suppose, um, the literature and and began to investigate for my own self. Because yeah, although family had chosen that um, uh, pathway that God would be a part of it, um, I needed to do that for myself. Mm. You know, at successive ages, and as you get older, you begin to sort of think differently. Okay. Yeah. And did you get to a point? quite quickly where you went, yes, I've studied this. I know what, um, what is out there and what's not. Um, and I definitely know about God now that he's, that he's there, that he's real, that he's there for me. 
or was it sort of a longer journey there? Yes, I'd have to say that it was more a series of of, of uh, um, sort of milestones that you would come across that you would look back and say. And I, I can recall that time that I, I spent living in the US uh, as one where I I began to look, but there've been subsequently times when you, when you become a parent and you've got your own children, you, you start to realise, well, hang, it's not just about me now. I've got to look after people and mm -hmm. uh, um, I'm responsible for them. And yeah. so then that starts another layer of, of thinking and uh, uh, there. And, and, and then, of course, you get challenges in your life as well. And, and that can sometimes rock your boat and, and make you question, you yeah, know, yeah. Um, there. So I'd say it's a, a journey that has sort of got a little bit of a peak and then down and then it's up again and then another mm. uh, and successive peaks along the way. Some people have one. Yeah. Um, my life has been more one of a series. Yeah, mine too, actually. You know, I yeah. know a lot of Christians that would say the same thing. Yes. Did you yeah. have a sense of, of what your purpose, you know, your, your big purpose in life was in those early years when you're, you're still at uni in the yeah. US? Yeah, look, when I was studying here in Australia before going to the uh, the States, I, I I questioned what it was that I wanted to do. And, and you, you sort of wonder, what do I want to do? And, and, and a few things had sort of come into my mind. Uh, I, I thought, I always knew I liked working with people, and so I thought that maybe medicine would be one one thing that I'd like to do. But then a long stint in hospital cured me of ever wanting to do medicine. <laughs> uh, what I discovered is I like working with normal people, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, uh, you know, I, look, I take off my hat to to, to the medical uh, team because they're they're dealing with people that are that are sick, that are vulnerable, that mm -hmm. are frustrated, yeah. tend to be a little bit. Um, disintegrating around the edges, they're frustrated, they want to go home, all yeah. those sort of things. And so there's a bucket load of patients that's needed there. And uh, one could argue that being a teacher, one requires a lot of patience as well. But kids can be a lot of fun. And mm. uh, as I said, I, I, I enjoyed there uh, that aspect. And I, I suppose somewhere in those years, I I combined a few things, the, the love of the outdoors and, and the environment, uh, so a degree in, in envir environmental science and studies yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, and yeah, the love of business and so a degree in economics. So you end up being an economics and geography teacher. And, uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm trying so. to work out the degrees that you've got there. You've just mentioned at least uh, two, I think. How That's many right. degrees do you have at this point? Uh, I've got uh, two uh, undergraduate degrees and a master's degree and uh uh, just finishing off the, uh, the the PhD. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah, that's a that's a lot of education for yeah. one lifetime. And so you you didn't have a strong sense of your purpose in those early years, but I guess that began to unfold. Uh, and, and you mentioned that um, you had a stint in hospital. Tell us about that. Yes, uh, at the age of sixteen, I was into I was into gymnastics in a big way, and I used to do a lot of trampolining. Uh, still own a trampoline, uh, an Olympic-sized trampoline, and still still bounce around on that. Uh, but I don't do the things that I used to. Uh, age catches up with you, and while the head knows what to do, the body doesn't always follow. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yes, yeah, so I was I was doing a double somersault and managed to uh, just bury my head into the mat at a high speed, and uh, yeah. yeah, broke my neck. And so I spent a year of my life learning to walk again. So you were 16 at that point? Mm. Wow. Yeah. That's young. Yeah, well, I was actually 15 when I did it, and I, and, and I had my 16th birthday in... Hospital? Uh, yeah. So, oh. uh, did you get cake at least? <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, did so. they have to spoon feed you with that or like what, what was yeah. your body like at that point yeah that, that that's a that's a pretty uh horrific sort of situation to be in i don't know whether you've ever seen movies of people that have sort of had uh, basically they start by shaving your head and then um uh, putting in some kind of sometimes some people have the halo brace um, oh yeah, yeah. um that i had i was fortunate i had what's known as crutchfield tongs which was where they drill holes in your skull and then they caliper like in and have a rope system that goes over the end of the bed and oh, wow. um, a series of weights on it stretching you out. No way. Yeah. I thought I was going to come out at six foot six, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, Maybe in the next lifetime. That's it. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Wow. Um, How long in hospital so, then? Yeah, a few months uh, yeah. there and that. And then um, 
home and then sort of walking stiffly you know you know you start with things like walking between parallel bars and and then with quad sticks oh well actually a zimmer frame you know, okay. the old grandma yeah. frame sort of yeah. uh and then you get onto quad sticks and then uh eventually uh i can recall my grandmother saying to me in about uh, the october uh the accident happened uh in january and she said to me she says you now walk close to normal you mm. know and i, I kind of like went oh right uh, thanks you know that's right. you know and uh, it was good to have somebody's external opinion as they as they were looking at you yeah and, yeah uh, that's a long journey of recovery though eh? from so, such an injury Yes, yeah. and uh, yeah, there was a few complications in there. They fed me the wrong medicine and that I was allergic to and oh. um, nearly killed me while I was there. No way. Yeah, a lot of healthy oh. and good people die in hospital through mistakes. But yeah, uh, um, yeah so we were we were fortunate um, uh, there and uh, yes. But anyway, that'll okay. do for that. <laughs> yeah, okay. Did you have a sense of... Um... Of where God was at in that whole journey. A lot of people mm. question mm. Uh, God and, and where he is at times like that when bad things happen. Yeah, definitely. In fact, there was that big question of why me? Yeah. And I, I can remember lying there in a, in a hospital bed. Um, I can still picture that ceiling because you, you, you look at it for hours uh, mm. at a time. You know, four hours on your back, two hours on one side, two hours on the other side. Right. You couldn't feed yourself. You were always fed. And yeah. I don't care who it is. Nobody can put a spoon in your mouth like you can. You know? <laughs> <laughs> they always thought it's too high, it's too <laughs> low. face paint. <laughs> yeah. They managed to whack a couple of teeth along the way. Or, yeah, yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, and you question, why, why me? Why mm. me? And... Uh, I look back on that now and I believe that I would not be where I am. I wouldn't be sitting here talking with you. I know a lot of my mates, uh, you know, left, uh, left God and, uh, mm. just went on a, on a journey on their own. Yeah. And, uh, um, yeah, I guess we were headed in that same direction and that was a, um, a recalibration of my life because when you are made to just lie there and there was nothing to do, you know, it's not mm. like you could read a book or anything like that. It's just time to think. Okay. So you obviously make it out of hospital and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at you right now. You, you survived. Uh, and <laughs> we've talked about your university experience, uh, with God there as well and how you were sort of just dis discovering God or, um, maybe even critiquing God. Could I use that term even? Sure. Um, you end up becoming a teacher yes. at some point. I know that much. And you're teaching in WA, I think. Are you, are you then a school principal even? I'm trying to track yes. my own. Uh, look, I, I was teaching in Western Australia, and it was at about that time that the, uh, the principal and the deputy principal of the college that I was uh, teaching at both left at the same time. Right. And uh, so I uh, was approached and they said, will you be... Um, the deputy principal, and I had always shied away from administration. I didn't like it. I was, mm. I'm blessed with a truckload of cynicism, and <laughs> <laughs> I, I just went, no, that's that's not me. I, I prefer to be elsewhere and actually mm. where the where the action is. Mm. And um, <clears throat> but they they made it sort of clear that with both going, they 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 wanted someone that had been there, and so I I then became. Um, the deputy principal and then the principal that was brought in uh, was on a study program and so it was not unusual for him to have to be away so I was often acting principal right yep. and uh, yeah so that's where I was uh, in Western Australia as um, deputy principal and and, I, and as I said from time to time acting principal when I was called to yeah. um, come over to Victoria okay so now anyone who's not Australian watching listening uh, we kind of on the east coast of Australia, which is where we are here recording this um, episode. We kind of think of WA as a different country, many of us. <laughs> so you, you basically were asked at that point. You're living in WA. You're a deputy principal, or often acting principal. You were off, offered a, a position, was it over in this country, in this side of that's correct, yes. Australia. Tell us about that and how <laughs> that kind of unfolded. Yes, I, I happen to have flown over here for, for some meetings and uh, I was in Victoria at the time when they uh, approached me and uh, the the gentleman that approached me was the person that had actually sent the request over 
um, unfortunately, I'd left uh, Western Australia and that piece of information actually hadn't come to me. And so he walked up assuming that I'd been aware about the offer of a job here oh, right. on the East. And hmm. he said, so what are you thinking? And I said, yeah, lots of things. Um, <laughs> Um, and so we went through this sort of little uh, byplay of, of confusion there yeah, for a few yeah. minutes there. And then um, he said, has anybody spoken to you? And I said, yes, yeah, a lot of people speak to me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then finally we got down to the fact that there was a job offer here in Victoria. And I had always said I'd, I never want to live or work in Sydney or Melbourne. Hmm. And, uh, and, of course, this was an offer to work in Melbourne. Why didn't you um, want to live in Melbourne? Ah, oh, look... Uh, that was mainly through ignorance. I didn't know Melbourne all that well, um, okay. but it was based on my uh, growing up in the Hunter Valley, north of Sydney. I knew yeah, what yeah. Sydney was like. Big city. I don't want to live there. You know, it's uh, funny you say that because I, um, I had always said to myself, I will never move to Victoria. I had, uh, prior to moving here eight years ago, I guess it was, um, I had visited here once, I think, maybe right. twice. Yeah. And I'd experienced the the bitter winter in oh, Victoria, yes. and uh, and I thought to myself, "No, nah, I am never moving so far south that it's you know that cold." Um, and I had a similar experience to what you're about to describe. I get the feeling that um, you know, life has another plan, or God has another plan. Yes, yeah. So I was taken and shown a few schools along the way, but we eventually got our way out to uh, to, to Gilson College uh, and the Taylor's Hill campus. Okay. We're here on the Moonda campus at the moment, but um, at that time I was uh, taken out to the Taylor's Hill campus, and it was very primitive. There was no road. It was a dirt track out there. It was a couple of buildings thrown on it. Uh, out in the middle of a paddock sort of thing. And, wow. yeah. and um, it sort of convinced me that, well, yeah, this was probably not where I wanted to be. I, I had a, uh, uh, a a good setup where I was. Um, we'd built our own home and, uh, you know, e everything was comfortable there. Mm. And uh, I climbed on the plane and for four hours I had this unmistakably really strong impression that God wanted us to be in Melbourne, wow. and I, um, I went back and I uh, explained to my wife um, what had happened. I said, "Oh, I got a, an offer to to go to Victoria," and she goes, "Oh, right, you know." And it was sort of fairly this dismissive, and mm -hmm. uh, and then I just started to, to describe the the school, and uh, she went, "Oh, really? My goodness, you know, wow, you know." And it was all sort of like, "Okay, yes, well, we we know where this is going, yeah. you know. Thanks very much, but mm -hmm. no thanks." And when I'd finished the description and and all the rest of it, there was a bit of a pause, and I said, "I think we ought to go." And mm. I don't know whether she dropped and broke anything uh, <laughs> at, at the at the time, um, but um, she said, "Why?" And I said, oh, "I just get this." sense that God wants us to be there. I mean, I've often prayed and wanted God to speak, you know. I'd like to hear something audible, something tangible. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I hear people sometimes say, I'm praying about this. And I I used to say, you know, you know pray for God to give you a mind that you will use, <laughs> you know. Um, uh, I'd been a little bit cynical, I suppose, about that. But I, here I was experiencing this for myself. Um, right. Was this the and, first uh, time you'd ever had this sense that God's telling me to do something? I guess something as significant as actually picking up my family and moving 4,000 kilometers across the continent. Right. And, yeah. Um, yeah, of, of such significance, yes, without yeah. doubt. And, okay. uh, you know, and as I look back on, on, you know, what we've been able to develop with a team of people and with God's guidance and blessing, yeah. um, I... I I see that you know God was uh, able to to use somebody that just simply said yes, and I, I guess that's what I'd uh, I'd share with anybody is that if you say yes to God, He'll be able to use you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. And and I, I guess um, the the history since that point was that tw about twenty five years ago. That's right. Um, yes. Yeah. I mean, yes. Gilson College, uh, with which I am a staff member at um, at one of its two campuses, has. Uh, grown and, and and it's but it's not just it's not just a school of a thousand plus on one campus and a couple of hundred plus on another campus it, it it's it's a school with a mission right it's a, mm, yeah uh, that's what makes it significant 
to yeah. you, I guess. Yes. Look, some people sort of say, well, look, you know, is, is, it, a, is it a big school? Is it a small school? That to me is irrelevant. Yeah. My question would be, is it a school that um, that is true to its purpose? Mm. Is, it a, is it a school that um, uh, is accurate and, and faithful to its mission? Mm. And how would you describe the, the that purpose, that mission? Yes. Well, our, our purpose statement reads uh, something like this. Our purpose is through excellence in education to develop people of Christian character and integrity. Mm. And uh, I, I guess that's where we, we, we need to focus. Yeah. And uh, the fact that it's the largest school uh, in the denomination uh, is irrelevant if it's not true to its purpose. Yeah, 100%. And, and that's, that's why... Um, when I look at your story, I, I think if I was in your position, I'd be a, I'd be a, a person that was quite happy with the fact that you, you've had a purpose in life that has been meaningful, not just in terms of you know helping people get a good career or um, achieve a decent standard of living, um, but Gilson College, where we are right now, is a place where people can actually meet God, and mm. to me, that's that's far greater than any material. Um, wealth that you could ever sort of achieve without doubt yeah Mm. i I wonder so we've we've talked a little bit about um um, purpose a a bit earlier in in our chat here looking back now do you have a a sense of what your purpose has been what god has sort of wanted out of your life or Mm. i i guess one of and and there are many purposes and many things that a person may be involved in, whether or not it's to be a good father, mm-hmm. uh, to, to be a, a faithful husband, and to, uh, to be a good friend to, to, to one's mates, uh, those, those sort of things. But I, I suppose in terms of what it is that I do for a, a calling, you know, because, I mean, when what you do with your time in the day, when you earn money, uh, some people are after a job. Some people are after a career, a career mm. and some people have a calling. Yeah. Uh, they're the three categories. And, and I suppose my calling has been to Christian education, to provide an environment where young people can learn about the Creator God mm. and uh, to provide an environment where there are teachers that can facilitate that and to connect with students and uh, to be able to do that through the many and varied vehicles that they have at their disposal, whether that's a maths class or a, uh, a music class or a, a, a walk in the bush through, because of the outdoor education program mm-hmm. um, or whipping down some ski fields, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, <laughs> wherever you are, um, there's yeah. an opportunity. And, that, and that's really how you know, our our schools uh, look at education. We we don't think at Gilson College and other Seventh Day Adventist schools around the world. We don't think of education as uh, educating just the the mind, right? It's it's the whole person we describe it as. Mm. Um, the and, physical, the academic, the ment- the the academic, the physical, the social, and the spiritual. Yeah, those are the four. Yeah, yeah. and and it's a bit like a car. You know, it's mm. got four tires, and your car runs best if all four tires are pumped up. Yes. That's a good way to put it. Okay, so we talked a little bit about your your experience as a teacher and then um, moving into leadership of schools. Uh, you're at Gilson College now, and uh, it's been quite a number of years that you've been here with us. Uh, tell us a little bit about um, the challenging times in your life. I mean, you, you had that one where you were a teenager, you are in the hospital, um, mm. As a grown man, as a as a adult, as a father, though, you know, what's been your experience with? Sure. Yeah. Look, uh, probably one of the most challenging experiences was uh, I was sitting in my study about eleven o'clock at night, and the phone rang, and I noticed that it was one of my sons, and uh, he said, uh, first words were, "Dad, Luke's had an accident," mm. and uh, I, um, I. I I just shrugged my shoulders at that and said, yeah, no worries. Uh, where are you now? 
Um, and the reason why I was so nonchalant, I, I suppose, about it was because we specialise in accidents, uh, <laughs> as I've already, both personally, but, you know, we, we, we snowboard, we ski, we, um, we surf, we downhill mountain bike, uh, mm. and, and so accidents are, are not an uncommon feature. And when I asked, where are you? And he said, in the back of an ambulance, I, I kind of responded with, oh, steady on, soldier boy, you know, how <laughs> serious is this? Yeah. And his response was, uh, it doesn't look good, Dad. And your heart sort of skips a little beat at that. And I, I then will said, well, hang on a tick. Uh, as, uh, as I started to try and get my, my thoughts together and stack up the questions in a logical order, I said, well, hang on, um, what, 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 uh, um, what's going on? Uh, is, he, is, he, um, is he breathing? And he said, yeah, they've got him breathing again. And I thought, okay, so um, is he conscious? No. All right, well, what do you see? And he said, um, uh, he's bleeding from the nose and the mouth and both ears. And in the moment that I heard mm -hmm. that, I, I realized that, you know, that was serious. Um, yeah. He'd actually been found in a pool of blood about, um, you know, half meter diameter around his head. And wow. uh, uh, it, uh, I, I got there and I, I said, look, it, it's time to shut up and let's just pray. Yeah. And so for the next, I don't know how long, we, we, he in the back of the ambulance and me in Melbourne just talked and prayed, talked and prayed. And, um, you know, that journey to the hospital was one where, you know, at one stage the ambulance stopped and we thought that that was because it was all over. And I remember asking him, is he gone? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, he says, I don't know. And as it turned out, there was an ambulance had been sent out uh, the driver had radioed ahead and sent an ambulance out, and uh, uh, they saw he saw the ambo on the other side of the the freeway um, sprint across and jump in the back. And I'm thinking, can it get any worse? And and then he said, um, he's now bleeding from the eyes. Wow. And uh, you 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 sort of think, um, God, if I ever need you, you know, now's a time that you can actually step in and do something. Yeah. And, and look, there are times when you pray those prayers and God is silent, mm. you know. I think of Christ, on, you know, and that lead up to his, his time on the cross, you know, prayed his heart out, you know, mm -hmm. take this away if you can. And uh, it, God was silent. And so, but on, uh, on this occasion, we were fortunate um, that, uh, you know, he, he got to the hospital. There was a period of time there where he um, uh, was in a coma and uh you know I, 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 we didn't know whether he was going to live or die wow. and um uh, I, I recall um you know being brought in by the by the fam by the uh, medical team and as our family sat opposite they made it very clear that they thought that he was going to die mm -hmm. and uh uh, the, the woman even sort of like, I remember her sort of like, you know, with a finger raised, you know, <laughs> pointing at me, sort of saying, um, uh, you need to understand he's hanging by his fingernails. Wow. And I, I said, look, um, I, 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 I got it, you know, I, I got it. Um, but um, it, was, it, was a, it was a challenging space. And I, I can recall the next day that that same woman meeting me in the corridor and saying, I noticed that your family prays. Hmm. And uh, I I didn't have much to say. I just sort of nodded and shrugged my shoulders. And, and she said, oh, I just thought I'd let you know that makes a difference. Hmm. I went, oh, okay. Um, and I sort of gestured to her as though you're a believer, you know. I, I didn't even verbalize it, but I just sort of looked at her, yeah. you know. And uh, she shook her head and said, no, 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 I'm not into that stuff. Wow. And I, I walked into the IC room and I, I said to my wife, I just had the weirdest conversation. <laughs> I, I said, you remember the head charang there in the medical team that was making sure that we understood that he wasn't going to make it? Because you're just telling me that prayer makes a difference. And when I asked her, when I kind of in sort of, you know, uh, suggested that maybe she was a believer, you know, just by my facial expressions, uh, she she quite quickly let me know that, no, that wasn't the case. I said, how does that work? <laughs> how can you see the evidence and yet not actually make that connection in your mind? Yeah. 
but uh, yeah, so you know, we were fortunate, and and Luke is, uh, you know, he he made um, uh, a full recovery, and he he um, still got the same uh, classic uh, sense of humour, and uh, uh, you know, we're blessed uh, that I can still say that I have two sons um, mm. there, and uh, you know, we we give the the praise, the glory, and the honour to God for that. Um, yeah, wow. Well. How did that compare with uh, that whole hospital experience there? How did it compare with your own? Was was it kind of a long, drawn-out recovery for him as well? Look, he, he needed to learn to walk again uh, as well, but it was a much shorter period of time. Um, okay. um, my life was never in danger with my own injuries. So it was just, uh, yeah. um, you know, face the, face the prospect of uh, a wheelchair, whereas Luke's was far more severe in that sense uh, there. Mm. And, uh, you know, I, um, I, I think that uh, having been the patient... And having been the parent, I know I'd much rather be the patient than be the parent. You know, mm. that's a far more challenging space to be in yeah. um, when you, you know, when you face the prospect of of uh, potentially losing a child. And, you know, I stood in my walk-in robe there wondering what do I wear, what do I take, you know, as we had to make a, a, a plane flight north. Um, yeah. And wondering what do I wear to my my kid's funeral? Or mm-hmm. What sort of clothes should I put in the bag if this is the case? Yeah, yeah. Um, we thank God that that was not the case. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had an interesting conversation with a family, um, or with a with a staff member rather. Um, about six months later, I, I went to a uh, a staff member's funeral, mm-hmm. and uh, one of my staff said to me, "This could have been you." Yeah. Um, what would you have done? And I asked a very good question. What would you have done right, had the outcome been different? And I said, it would have, like any trauma, tested my faith in God. Mm. But I would hope that um, that the history that you have, you know, w- that relationship you have will sustain you um, you know, through those challenging times. Oh, yeah. Oh, and I want to get to, to the question of doubt in a moment, uh, but I'm still in the in the in that, that first day in my mind. What do you do? You know, you've just found out that your son is likely going to die. You've, you know that he's at the hospital at this point. What do you do between the time that you know that he's in the hospital and at least someone's going to try to take care of him? Yeah. And the time when you know that you can jump on a plane and get up there, what, what happens in that sure, period? Yeah. There? Look, uh, the first thing that I did is in, in between phone calls, uh, I I wrote emails and made phone calls to other people around the world that I knew, asking them to pray. Right. And uh, I can recall one one good friend uh, in, in the West saying to me, "So when do you fly up?" And I said, "I, I don't know yet." And mm. I said, "Well." Uh, have you not booked a ticket yet? I said no. I said my first, my first port of call is to actually ask people to pray, and I'll worry about the ticket later. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that was that was the order in which I did things, and right, uh, yeah. yeah, and I know that people all around the world, you know, were were praying because I I had literally sent requests to people all around the world, yeah. um, asking them, you know, to step in. And, uh, you know, look, I, I've, I've prayed my heart out on occasions and I've, I've flown home for a funeral. Yeah. Um, God is silent sometimes, but there are, but there are times when he, he steps in and he makes a, um, uh, he makes something dramatic happen. You know, I, I can recall we, we sat there with the ENT specialist, the, you know, throat, um, guy and he was looking at, at Luke's x-rays and he, his comment was he, he's looking at the x-rays he's looking up at Luke and he, you're Luke aren't you he, 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 verifying it and, he, mm-hmm. and he's shaking his head and you're sort of wondering what does that mean you know you, you watch a doctor for every little sign what, what, is, what does this mean yeah. and he says um, I've never seen x-rays like this before this is just you are you are so so fortunate there well, actually, he says, I have seen x-rays like this, but not on people that have lived. Hmm. Wow. Uh, and, uh, you know, my son and I looked at each other and we sort of like, um, yeah, 
Thank you, Lord. Yeah. He got given a second chance. Sure did. Yeah. Uh, were there others that, other medical people that kind of doubted whether he was actually going to make it, whether he was viable? Yes. Uh, right back at the scene of the accident, um, when the first amb- ambulance uh, arrived, um, uh, the two ambos walked up and, and one of them made the comment, um, uh, they had noticed that there was a group of boys um, I call them the mop heads because they're all the surfy types with the, oh. the, the you know, the, the bleached bomb there. Mm-hmm. there. And uh, um, there was a group of uh, Luke's mates standing in a circle there praying. Mm-hmm. And uh, she, as she walked up, uh, she, she looked at them and pointed and said, that's cute, but this one here won't make it to the hospital. And uh, wow. um, she wasn't aware that one of the boys that was actually helping Luke was actually his brother. Oh. You know, and so, you know, I, I think of Joel sort of listening to that and hearing that, you know, oh, yeah. um, uh, that's, a, that's a challenging thing to hear, mm-hmm. um, you know, and he experienced that uh, in, in, in the back of the ambulance, uh, that, that ride, that's something that, uh, you know, I guess is uh, imprinted, uh, you know, uh, in, his, in his mind for, for the rest of his life as well. Yeah. Oh, um, I can't imagine being in that position as mm. hearing your brother's Apparently not going to make it. Yeah. T- tell me about this other um, ambulance officer, though. You 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 you'd met yeah. one of these two, I think. I'm yeah. It wasn't that that one you were just talking about. Yeah. Look, one one of the other ambulance uh, officers. He's um, he was actually a believer, and uh, yeah. he he got there and he said, um, "Look." Um, you're more experienced, and I know that I'm supposed to be in the back of the ambulance. Let's swap, right, right for this for this particular um, incident. And so he drove the ambulance and put um, the the other ambulance uh, officer in the back, and uh, and he drove. And um, yeah, it was um, probably about uh, three or four years later that I actually happened to meet up with him. Mm. And uh, how did that yeah. actually happen? It's, well, he knew it's... one of my staff, as it turned out, and yeah, okay. uh, the staff member brought him and said, uh, "I just want to introduce you to somebody." And I, I was introduced to him, and we sort of said hello. And then um, he said, oh, "I drove the ambulance for your son." Wow, <laughs> that was that was pretty amazing. You know, I um, I remember that. Uh, it was kind of like. Uh, yeah, just just gave him a hug, mm. yeah, big man hug. Yeah, <laughs> mm. yeah, just said thanks, and uh, yeah, it was it, it was a it was a great experience, and just to hear the the, the whole thing from his perspective, oh, yeah. you yeah. know, of uh, there, and you know, obviously, you know, he had a part to play there in that as well. Yeah, and he's a he's a Christian. I'm guessing as yeah. he's driving down the freeway there, he's just praying, God, yeah, help me to get this this kid there on time. And, yeah. yeah, wow. Yeah. Yeah, no, it was a, yeah, it was a, an awesome thing, and I, um, I remember taking him to my wife, and, uh, and, you know, same reaction from her. You know, yeah. she, she sort of, I just said, I, I don't think you know who this gentleman is, and uh, she said no, and I said he drove Luke's ambulance. Um, yeah, he got a big lady hug there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Man, that guy deserves a Christmas card every year for the rest of his life. <laughs> I yeah, take my hat off to to people who are in that line of work. It's yes, exactly. The stuff they they deal with and and push through with it's hmm. something else. Exactly. You know, I, I, we we talked about doubts before. You touched on it, and and I'm always curious to hear um, when I'm speaking with a Christian who's had a bit of a journey with God, um, how they how they deal with doubt. Um, and most people have have not said to me, oh, I, I never have any doubts, you know. Mm. Most Christians I've spoke with, spoken with who have really actually journeyed with God So yeah, I've had heaps of doubts. Mm. Um, you know, what's what's been your experience? Yes, uh, look, during that experience with, with Luke's accident, I would write um, and I would share with my staff um, once a week a little outline of, of, of the situation. And um, one of my staff came up to me a month or two later and said to me, something that you, you wrote in one of your emails to us um, uh, haunts me. Mm-hmm. And I, I said, um, really? 
And uh, she said, yeah. I said, what was it that I wrote? She said, um, pray to God in the good times so that he's no stranger to you in the bad times. Mm. Now, I don't actually remember writing that. <laughs> so, so I went back to my emails and I checked. And I went, yeah, I did write that. And I thought, well, I, I think God inspired those thoughts um, there because I, I don't recall um, writing it, but, but it, it's, tr it's true. Um, and so I guess in terms of that doubt, um, I have chosen to, in calm, um, sort of stable times of my life, to sit down and to write out why it is that I believe. Hmm. And and so, um, you know, I, I've, and, and I've actually written it down and there's a number of reasons that, I, that I've put together, you know, uh, as to... I guess factors that help me to remember that in the tough times, why it is that I do believe. Okay. And Can I, you give us a little uh, bit of a summary? Yeah, of yeah. Look, um, uh, there, there's about seven points, and, and it goes, uh, and I've sort of got a little acronym in my head, but uh, it's it's uh, the first one. It's LAP, which is linguistics, you know, and it's it's things that I see in language, you know. I, I see I, I see elements of 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 the scriptures in the Chinese language, and that's a whole story in and of itself. There, yeah. archaeology, and and you know, I've I've been privileged to have have walked through Hezekiah's tunnel, but I've read about that in the Bible, and so then to actually go and see it, mm, you know, mm. um, so you know, linguistics, archaeology, and then prophecy, where where the, where the Bible has actually indicated this will happen, and it has, yeah. you know, and so th there's three, and and then there's other ones where you know there's four more where. Um, coherence of the biblical record. It's it's a lot of people think the Bible is a book. It's actually a collection of books, mm, yep. plural, written by many different people over the gap of around fifteen hundred years, incredible. and and yeah. that's just an, that that coherence just sort of is is incredible and and mind blowing. Mm. Um, and then the um, the the idea of um, uh, of just sort of seeing people's changed lives, yeah. you know, lives that have been changed and, and, and so on. Uh, and then, um, you know, uh, other things that, uh, that, that come to, to mind uh, is microbiology. This is a new science, relatively new. I certainly wasn't around in, in, in Darwin's day, but, you know, that there has challenged a whole paradigm of science. Mm. And so, you know, there, there's a whole series of things that I've, you know, chosen, and I've just given them to you off the top of my head, you know, yeah, but, yeah. But, but I think it's a great thing to actually write them down. And, and when you've got them written down, you know, in times of stress and, and challenge, you go back and you look at it and you go, yeah, that's why I believe. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Is there anything else you'd you'd kind of want to? I mean, we could talk for hours and, <laughs> yeah, about about your story. You've you've and you've shared with me before. You know, other experiences you've had with God that we probably don't have time for in this episode. Sure. Maybe we'll have to do a part two one day. Uh, Is there anything yeah. else you just sort of want to share with people who are curious about God? And uh, I, I guess probably I would finish up by saying. Um, you know, Jesus was asked about, you know, in one at one stage, you know, what's the greatest commandment, mm. you know, that uh, and and he he says the first is to to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, mm. you know. And so we each of us has been given a mind, which is an incredible thing. I'm, I'm not talking about the brain; that's where it all happens. The brain is the physical thing, but the mind is actually what goes on inside the, the electricity that's there. And, and the mm. ability to be able to think is just a, an amazing thing. And so I, I would just simply say to people, use your mind to look for the evidence because th there is evidence there. Um, it's all around us. And, and you know, the, the transcendent, although unseen, uh, there is evidence for it, you know, as, as, as Paul says in Romans 1 verse 20, he says, you know, since the beginning of creation, uh, the evidence is there, you mm. know, where we can see the things 
that I've been made and they help to interpret the things that are invisible. I haven't quoted it word for word. I've given mm. you a loose uh, uh, paraphrase, the Vodell paraphrase yeah. on that there. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it's it's true. And if, if we look, whether it's through a microscope or through a telescope, we'll see patterns. Mm. And if mm. we see those patterns, they're an indicator that there's a designer out there. Mm. And I would just encourage uh, any individual with a good mind, a thinking mind, to use it um, for their benefit. And uh, mm. and uh, not only will they be better off, but God will be glorified as well. Mm. Well, I think that's a great place to finish our, our chat yeah. today. Mark, yeah. thanks so much for making some time to be with us here. And yeah. I've loved listening to your story and I look forward to hearing more in the future. Yeah. No worries. Yeah. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having us. Take care, mate. Cheers. Bless you.